I said earlier, it certainly is good to see you all this morning. We're glad that you're here to worship, worship with us in God's house. And uh, I appreciate Deacon's giving me an opportunity to stand before you. You know, I uh, was in the barber shop talking to Ronnie not too long ago and, and uh, telling him that ever so often I got to preach. And he said, uh, you know, he said, I bet you really kind of relish that, don't you? And I said, yeah. You know, after standing in a pulpit straight for 28 years and not hardly missing any Sundays, you kind of kind of want to do it again once in a while and I appreciate that you folks give me the opportunity to do that and uh, I ask that you'd pray for me as I stand here this morning I've got some things that I want to share with you and uh, if I put a title on this message this morning I would call it have you lost the cutting edge have you lost the cutting edge there's a story over in 2 Kings, the 6th chapter, that has uh, been one of my favorite down through the years. I have uh, written two or three sermons on it. In fact, I even entered one of them into a contest. I'm not telling you how it came out, but uh, nevertheless, I did. And uh, uh, it's a story that, uh, that I think is kind of unique in all of God's Word. Uh, 2 Kings, the 6th chapter, I'm going to read the first seven verses. Um, you want to follow along with me? You've got your Bible there. Uh, kind of give you a little bit of a setting of this. Uh, uh, Elisha was getting some of the young men ready for going out and uh, serving God preaching and, and so on but he kind of had a, a seminary there and uh, they said well Elisha this place is just too small we need a bigger place that we can uh, uh, study together and learn together and uh, here's what happened as far as the scripture says the company of the prophets said to Elisha look the place where we meet with you is too small for us Let's go into the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and let us build a place where, let us build a place there for us to live. And he said, go. Then one of them said, won't you please come with your servants? I will, Elisha replied. And he went with them and they went to the Jordan and began to cut down trees. As one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. Oh, my Lord, he cried out. It was borrowed. The man of God, that's Elisha, the man of God asked, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and threw it there and made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. Then the man reached out his hand and took it. Father, we pray that you would bless the reading of your word this morning. Be with us now in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you imagine that scenario there, though, of, of this, this group of men? They were cutting trees. I don't know how many of you have ever cut trees with an axe. Uh, we kind of got chainsaws anymore. We do it. But it used to be, I can remember... That was the way that we cut down trees. We'd take an axe and we'd cut them down. I don't ever remember getting close to a riverbed and doing that, but uh, I've cut a few trees down like that. Well, in this particular case, this poor guy, he was just uh, beating away with that tree, and all of a sudden the head flew off of his axe. And there he was. He said, no, I barred that. What am I going to do? Because... He went out there in the water. He didn't know how to get a hold of it. And Elisha come up to him. And uh, uh, he said, well, where did it fall at? Now, here's something that I want you to really get a hold. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really build on this this morning. I want you to get a hold of this if you would. Uh, Elisha said, well, where did it fall? And he said, well, it's over in there somewhere. And so Elisha went and cut a stick 
he cut a stick, threw it out there, and that stick gathered up somehow, God's miracle, picked up that axe head, and then Elisha said, lift it out. And then the man reached out his hand and took it. The man reached out his hand and took it. Elisha made that iron axe head float so it could be recovered. I want you to think about that for a little bit. What was it? What was it that got a hold of that axe head and brought it to the surface so it could be recovered? Well, we're going to build on that, as I said a while ago. We're going to build on that a little bit more here as we go along. But I, I want to back up just a minute and give you a little bit more of the, the setting behind this particular incident. The king of Syria, whose name was Ben-Hadad, was disturbed because uh, Jehoram, the king of Israel, uh, seemed to have inside intelligence about Syria's battle plans. And every time he'd get ready to get a, peop a gr bunch of his soldiers together, what would happen was that the Israelite army would be there ahead of him waiting for him. And he said, I can't figure that out. There's something wrong here. Somebody, there's some an insider there somewhere. He said, there's a spy in the camp. And uh, one of his servants said, well, that's Elisha. He's the one that's doing that. He was the one that was revealing the Syrian secrets to Jehoram. And so Ben-Hadab sent out a large army, and uh, they were going to capture Elisha and his servants. And so they surrounded the area where Elisha was, was staying. And, and uh, his servants that were there with him looked up and said, Oh, look up there at all them soldiers. What are we going to do? They're going to get us. They become terrified. And Elisha prayed that God would open those servants' eyes so that they could see the mountain full of God's horses and the chariots of far that was there to defeat that Syrian army if they came after him. And uh, Elisha prayed, and God struck that Syrian army blind. They all went blind. And he led that army of troops into the city of Syria. And he told Jehoram, the king of, of um, Syria, that, or the king of Israel, not to kill the Syrians, but to give them food and water. And uh, then they were released. And uh, so later on, as it went on, and I was talking to Greg a little bit there a while ago, uh, it got so bad in the land that there was a great famine, and they were actually resort, re resorting to cannibalism. And if you can imagine, and this is just a little bit side to the story, but if you can imagine, two women agreed. That each one had a son, and one of them said, let's eat, eat your son today, and tomorrow we'll eat mine. So they boiled the one son, they ate him. And next, next day, the woman that still had the other son, she ran and hid her son. She wouldn't let him do that. Well, that resulted in a whole different thing. But uh, anyway, that cannibalism, if you can imagine things being so bad that you boil and eat your own son, that's unreal. But anyway... The spiritual perception that Elisha had was just amazing. Elisha was a great man of God. But you know, the thing of it is that comes out here is that fear and doubt, fear and doubt are the very root, the very root of spiritual blindness. That's why we can't see things a lot of times because we let that fear and doubt get in the way. And that's what happened on this occasion. God had taken care of them. He had an army surrounding that whole thing. Faith in God, folks, can open blind eyes 
and give spiritual discernment. It can and it will. But let's look again at this lost axe head. Quite a story there, lost axe head. That certainly gave grief to that borrow whenever it hit the water out there. And he said, oh my, I borrowed that. I borrowed it and now it's out there in the water and I can't get it. So along comes Elisha. And uh, you know when it really gets down to it, a lost axe head served no useful purpose. It, uh, it was danger of being permanently damaged by the rust and the corrosion caused by uh, being in that water like that. And uh, so it was, it was just of no use the way that it was. And so lost axe heads require immediate action to bring them back into use. And so what did Elisha do? He went and cut a stick. I don't know how long it was. He cut a stick. And he said, now where was that axe head at? It was out in there somewhere. He threw that stick out there, and that axe head jumped up and jumped on the end of that stick. Now, why am I saying all of that? Well, I say that there's probably a lot of axe heads that are lost. People that are working in our churches, that should be working in our churches, are lost. But there was only one remedy to that. There was a stick. A stick that you wouldn't think would be of any use at all. But that stick jumped down, got that axe head, and brought it to the surface where that, that servant, that prophet, could reach down and pick it up and put it to use again. So, whenever we see a lost axe head, and yes, I am relating the lost axe head to a lot of people in our churches who aren't doing what they ought to be doing. They're not serving God the way that they should be serving God, and we need to throw some sticks out there for them so that they can be brought to life. But you know what? You may be that stick. All of us have all of us have a role to play. But most of the time, we want to be the big shot, don't we? We want to be the, I did this and I did that. But I ask you this morning, as a Christian leader, as someone working in the church, have you lost your cutting edge? Have you lost your cutting edge? Do you realize maybe that that axe head doesn't belong to you? That it's borrowed? You know what, folks? Spiritual power is cutting edge. And we need to look at this thing from a, a very practical standpoint. We need to tell the Lord exactly where our axe head was lost at. What's keeping us from serving the way that we should be serving? Where did we lose the axe head at? Spiritual recovery and restoration always involves an act of, of human obedience combined with a divine miracle. Son, you're my stick. How many of you are willing to play the role of a simple stick to connect to that axe head and get them back on the road again. Sometimes that's necessary. There's two roles to play there. There's the axe head that's doing an important job, but they've kind of slacked off. They're not working like they should be. What's causing that? What is happening? We need a stick, and maybe you are that stick. Maybe you're the one that needs to take a look. Am I? Am I the one that's causing the problem? I think I can best explain that in, into a story that I came across some time back. There's a, a man by the name of Kurt Scarborough. 
And uh, he is the president of the Lifeway Foundation and the Baptist hierarchy, so on and so forth. And, but he told in this story about his experience along this line. He said that in 1991, he was wrestling with the idea of going to New England because there was a big church that was calling for a pastor that was right at the side of a university. And he thought, boy, if I could get in that big church and so all those college students, I can have a great big church. And so he really wanted to do that. And he really desired to return to a local church ministry like that and to serve as a senior pastor and make it a great church with much potential for impacting the lives of Americans by teaching those college kids as they come out of the university. It sounds like a pretty good idea, doesn't it? I mean, that would be a pretty good ministry to have. But he said that the, the, the scripture, the verse which the Holy Spirit used to quicken him about this situation was this one in 2 Kings, the 6th chapter, and the 6th verse where it said, Elisha cut a stick and threw it there and made the iron axe head float. And he says, I pondered, as I pondered God's will for my life, I began to sense in my spirit that, was he, that he was speaking to me personally with that scripture. I had received the words and the impressions from the Holy Spirit, but this was different, a different thing. It was longer and, and more detailed. And so he sat down at the table and he wrote down some things, and, and here's what he said that he got from this. He said, Son, you are my stick. You are my stick. I did not make you to be a beam or a pillar. I didn't make you to be a part of the floor or of the wall or the roof. I didn't even make you to be an axe handle. My purpose for you is to bring the axe heads to the surface. Be a stick that goes and brings that axe head up. And so instead of trying to play the big it, sometimes we need to be that little stick that maybe will help that axe head to do what they're supposed to do. Be a catalyst to enable some of God's other servants, again, that their cutting edge may improve back to where it was so that they, through God's power, can again begin to harvest timber, shape beams and planks, and build my kingdom house. Do you see what I'm saying here we don't all have the same job some of us would be better to be sticks just helping that axe head understand what they need to be doing and to get back on the ball do what they need to be doing be content with the role that God has given you to play let me say that again and I really want to emphasize it be content with the role that God has given you to play. Don't try to be something that God doesn't want you to be. Find out. Know for sure what God wants you to do. And He'll let you know. I guarantee He'll let you know. You see, without the proper axe head, with the handle on it, cutting down trees, we're not going to build God's, be able to build God's kingdom the way that it should be built. We can't do that. So, if we're going to be successful, and here even in this church, if we're going to be successful in reaching out to the community around us, there are certain roles that each of us must play. And I say to you this morning, do the very best that you can to decipher that role. And maybe it's just to be an old stick that brings the axe head, that one that needs to be working, up out of the water. Maybe just being an old stick. You see, without, without you, 
the kingdom construction could be delayed for a time or it could be stopped altogether. Stop and think about your role. Stop and think about what you're best at doing instead of trying to do what somebody else is doing. So, be my stick, son, and I will use you to bring glory to my name. That's what God told Kurt Scarborough. And I believe that's what he's telling each and every one of us. Be my stick. There's no more important task. There's no more role in life more significant than this one I've assigned to you and designed for you. The job that God has designed for each one of us. We all have different roles to play. Play your role. If it's just to be an old stick that was laying out here somewhere, go get that axe head, throw it in the water and bring that axe head up so that things will be progressing and happening like they should be. In a little while, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper. And one of, the, one of the really important things about the Lord's Supper is that each one of us, as we partake in the Lord's Supper, we need to examine ourselves. And that's the purpose of me talking to you the way that I have this morning. I would want you I believe through God's word it tells us to examine yourself you're the only one that can do that I don't have the ability nobody else here has that ability you need to look at yourself and when we come to the New Testament there's only this one simple institution that Jesus left with us and that's the Lord's Supper. And that was established with a very definite view of preventing the people from forgetting who Jesus was. And so faithful attendance at the Lord's Supper will keep that from happening because what did Jesus say? He said, do this in remembrance of me. It's so easy to forget. We let things slip by and time gets in the way. But Christ's disciples are supposed to, the, to come to the Lord's Supper for no other reason holy than to remember Jesus. And take a look at ourselves. Take a look at ourselves. Don't think about anything else except Jesus Christ. That's what you're remembering as you partake of the Lord's Supper. Don't let something else mar and mutilate the supper itself. See, that was happening in Paul's time, and that's why he wrote in Second Corin or First Corinthians, as he did in the eleventh chapter. He said, "You're coming together, and you're eating your own food, and you're everybody's trying to bring it, outdo everybody else, and and on and on." He he told those people what they were doing wrong. They weren't observing the Lord's Supper in the proper way. They were trying to see who could outdo each other. And so he said, whenever you remember Jesus at the Lord's Supper, there will naturally come stealing into that a sense of conscience and a sense of guilt. Do you remember Jesus and who he is? Are you really remembering Jesus and who he is? That's what we're supposed to be doing when we partake of the Lord's Supper. Jesus was God's ideal man, and Jesus is God's standard. And so the only way that we measure ourselves, uh, our lives, is by that perfect standard of Jesus Christ. And when we do that, we're bound, we're bound to realize how short we fall of serving God and doing what we want to. But then again, we get back to what I originally was trying to get across. Some of us are sticks. Some of us are the axe heads. Some of us have different jobs. But look at what you're supposed to be doing. When this sense of guilt or even conscience of wrongdoing, when that enters our mind, then 
uh, through the supper, that symbol of sacrifice and, and sin, uh, Jesus atoned for all of that. As we talked about different times, God has forgiven us of those things. We just need to accept that forgiveness and move on. And gratitude to God is the parent of praise. Be thankful to God for what he's done for you. Be thankful for him for what he's provided. And so out of that sense of forgiveness that we know that Jesus Christ taught, there comes that gratitude, that praise that we need to put on Jesus and on God. Praise holds the most important, prominent place in our worship. And that gratitude for him forgiving our sins and springing forth is the, with the praise that has produced that is such an important thing. So maybe we could look back at one Old Testament scripture out of Psalms, the 103rd chapter that was written, says, Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. And why would we do that? Because he forgives all of our sins. And so this time, as we get ready to partake of the Lord's Supper, it brings Jesus Christ to our memory. Don't forget who Jesus is. Keep that in your mind. And at this time, recall our guilt and his grace. And, and recall his our poverty and his pardoning power that, that is there. And recall our misery and his mercy towards us. And strive with the deepest gratitude that you have in your heart of worship to produce happiness and, and worship in your lives. That's so important, folks. That's so very, very important. So at this time, I would like to, for the deacons to come forward and let's observe the Lord's Supper. And I'd like for you to think about what I've said to you this morning about uh, do it in the name of Jesus and not because of something that we want or that we do. about the Lord's Supper is contained in three of the Gospels. John didn't have anything about it, but Matthew's got it in the 26th chapter, and Mark has it in the 14th chapter, and Luke has it in the 22nd chapter. And it all followed the same pattern. And that pattern was that it says that Jesus broke the bread, and uh, then he broke the bread and passed it to his disciples. And so that's what we want to do to start with is to take this bread and uh, uh, we will, I'm going to ask uh, Don if he will lead us in prayer over the bread and uh, then we'll pass it out.
Scripture tells us that Jesus took the bread, and he broke it into pieces, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do in remembrance of me. Then the scripture says that Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. As often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Okay, I'll let these gentlemen go back to their seats for just a minute. As we thought about what was happening today, as I talked about that lost axe head, I just wonder if there's anyone here this morning that uh, feels like that you need to do something for the Lord. Maybe it's salvation. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. If someone wants that in their life, they need it. That's so important. Or maybe there's someone here that wants to uh, join this church, be baptized. If that's the case, you're, the invitation is open to you. Brother, uh, here we go.
she's come forward and she says that she wants to join this church and be baptized later. <laughs> we'll uh, let that baptism wait until Brother Tim gets back, which will be the 10th of July. And so, uh, but in the meantime, uh, let me put it this way. I don't know, I'm from Missouri, you know, and all this kind of stuff, but uh, uh, I would like to see somebody make a motion that we accept her as a member in the church and then we're going to vote on it, okay? Okay, we've got motions. Good. I think they all want you. You think so? 